All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another fantastic episode on Solving the People Puzzle, your podcast around everything people. And uh, every single time I do this, I have a fantastic guest with me. Today is even more special because Mandy, who's on the call with me and on the pod with me, is a dear friend, someone that I met many, many years ago. Mans, who would have thought that we would end up on a pod together? Uh, no, no one probably, but really excited <laughs> to be here. Thanks for having me. No, it's such a pleasure. I'm very excited to have you on. It's a topic that I believe we should be speaking about more. And so I'm really happy to have you on board. But before we jump in, I would love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Awesome. Thanks so much. So I'm Mandy Muchnick, and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Panda Health. Um, and at Panda Health, we're on a mission to really democratize access to mental health care of individuals and also help companies understand their employees better, how they're doing, and really intervene on the things that matter to them. Fantastic. Man, um, obviously, uh, if, if one were to LinkedIn you, you didn't start your career in <laughs> mental health or anything HR. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you are a CA with a corporate finance and banking background. Is that correct? I mean, I don't know why you had to sell me out right at the beginning of the episode, but uh, I've been doing well to fake it so far in the, in the industry. But yes, that's right. So I am a CA by profession, although always took a bit of an unconventional route, I'd say. So I did my articles at Investec um, and I love my time there. I spent five years in investment banking and left with someone from Investec actually to work in private equity thereafter. Um, but for those who know me, I've always had a real passion, I think, to have an impact in the world. So I used to run around on the side of my career, I guess, trying to fulfill that um, and, and doing so, I guess. But really, I think everyone has a pivotal change moment in their life. And, and mine really was when we started a family and I just started. Firstly, I guess your time is, is all of a sudden cut, right? It's diff more difficult yeah. to run two parallel lives because now you really do have two lives. Um, but you also just start looking at the opportunity cost of your time a bit differently. And I really wanted mm, to find mm. a way, I guess, to merge my passions between business and, and having an impact in the world. Um, and admittedly, mental health wasn't actually something that was, you know, a specific passion area or, or an, an area that I even had significant knowledge about up front. But I was lucky, I guess, to get the opportunity to join, I think, two of the most respected entrepreneurs, business builders, and a clinical psychologist in the country. Um, and when you get that opportunity, you jump at it. And I think we really are solving one of the biggest issues facing society today. So mm -hmm. that is how yeah. a chartered accountant ended up in a mental health company. I love that story because it never... It, oh, it very seldomly actually ends up being as we intend it to be, if you think of your career. And I always say this, when you, when you follow your passion, um, the passion will lead you wherever the passion is. And so, you know, energy goes where energy flows and uh, yours took a couple of turns, but it seems mm -hmm. like you're in a space now where you're really enjoying it and it's a, it's a new chapter. So mental health, Mandy, wow. I mean, where do we even start? We, we had the pandemic. I don't think the pandemic necessarily opened up this topic for the very first time it's been around forever some some organizations might have a bigger emphasis on it than others but definitely the pandemic did give us a lot of insight into how important it is to balance all aspects of health uh, including mental health but from an audience perspective and i say this in every episode solving the people puzzle has got listeners from the hr in environment business owners entrepreneurs people who are passionate about understanding people and solving what we call this puzzle because people are so you know layered and and diverse and and at times difficult to work with and understand so how do you approach that and your understanding from a mental health perspective yeah it's such a good question and i think you hit the nail on the head that the the covid-19 pandemic didn't really start the mental health crisis it was there before um, but it's really been kind of termed the silent pandemic now because no one did talk about it before, right? Sure. Um, but what COVID did do was really bring it to the fore. It is very topical now, but there's still huge stigma attached to it. So, you know, we can, we can mm. kind of dig into that a bit later. But I think people don't actually realize just how bad the stats are. And there they really are lots of them out there. I think, you know, from an individual perspective, you know, the majority of people are saying that they're struggling with such significant amounts of stress that it's truly affecting their health and happiness. Um, I think from a business perspective as well, 
wellness has kind of always been seen as the nice to have bucket. This is something nice that we do for our employees. Um, but there are a lot of stats out there now as well. You know, they're not our, our stats in specific, but obviously they do validate kind of the business case for this. So Stats SA have come out with stats to say that 14.5% of work hours a month are lost to poor productivity directly linked to mental health. Um, and 60% of exit interviews actually attribute the reason that they're leaving to poor mental health. So, sure. you know, it's gone from something that you used to see as this nice to have for employees to mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. actually is good for business as well, right? Because that is something that's really hitting your bottom line. Um, but the market has to evolve with the time as well, right? Because that means we can't kind of try to so solve those same problems with solutions that typically haven't been accessed you know, mm, to a great mm. extent, we really need to think about things differently. Sure. I, I want to take you back to one of the things you just said, where traditionally, or in the past, we would see what budget is left and then go on a team build, or we would celebrate a day or a afternoon. It is majority of the cases, a reactive intervention when it is too late. Um, would you agree with that? And that even though there is still a lot to do, that awareness at least around where in the life cycle of an employee do we actually start focusing on it has, has started changing? Yeah, I, th I think it has started changing, but it's funny, you kicked off the episode saying we go way back, right? And we, we do go way back because we grew up playing competitive tennis together. And I think if you look at competitive athletes, you know, any of them will tell you what separated them from the rest was not really their physical talent, but it was their mm -hmm. mental toughness, right? And mm -hmm. we just actually need to think about it the same for everyday people, right? But from a physical health perspective, we know exactly, you know, what nutrition, what exercise, what sleep we need to feel good, even look good. Um, but we just haven't applied the same kind of logic, you know, from a mm -hmm. mental health perspective. And so mm -hmm. as an employer as well, you know, looking at it completely differently to say, you know, this sort of reactive care that's been there historically it is very important you know for specific moments of distress but how do we actually start getting employees to think about their mental health the same way they do their physical health you're not going to wait until you're about to have a heart attack to go to the gym you know why are we only talking about anxiety depression burnout those are all outcomes right what are actually the root causes how do we understand the day-to-day -day stresses that people are going through and give them the resources and support they need to deal with that mm. before we get to anxiety, depression, burnout. I'm, I'm so glad you say that because I can imagine an audience member going, okay, yes, there is a bigger awareness around the topic. I'm hearing it, I'm hearing it on podcasts, I'm reading it about it in the magazines, someone at the office has said something, but how do we help them understand, like at the core, what is mental health? Yeah. And, and, and then we can deep dive into the causes, the effects, the symptoms, what we can do proactively and reactively. But I mean, as a baseline, what is this? It's it's such a good question. And, you know, I'm actually going to think about it for a second because I feel like people, again, understand physical health so well. So mm. if you look at physical health, right, and we look at the evolution of medicine even, medicine 1.0, you know, back in the day was all about, I guess, you know, doing whatever you needed to do to help someone survive, certain techniques, barbaric, whatever they were. Then you had yep. medicine 2.0, which was the rise of doctors and medicine, and it's very effective, right? It, but it is reactive, completely reactive yep. again, right? Yes. There's um, a symptom, let's treat it. Exactly, exactly. And then what we've seen a lot of, and I think what everyone understands now is medicine 3.0, which is about being proactive, predictive. You know, we all wear wearables. We, we know like what we're doing, right? And if you follow like a same kind of journey with mental health, you had mental health 1.0, which was terrible. People went to, you know, asylums were forgotten about. Mental health 2.0 would have been, you know, the rise of the professionals, your psychologists, psychiatrists, your traditional EAPs. That's kind of where they would fit in. Very good. But again, like medicine 2.0 reactive. And then what you see a lot of in the market is what we call mental health 2.1. And that's really the digitization of that kind of solution. So now you can connect virtually with a counselor, which helps people from a time perspective. But again, when you say, you know, what's mental health? We think about mental health 3.0. You know, how do we be that wearable? How do we be the eat, sleep, nutrition for sure. your mind that you need 
um, from a mental perspective and really, again, be mm. proactive, predictive and, and put mm. those things mm. around people and realize that everyone's journey is different, right? Again, same as physical health. Some people love high intensity training. Other people want to run. Some people want to do yoga, Pilates. Mental health is the same. It's not a one size fits all. What are those yep. even small incremental things that are going to help you mm. build mm. resilience? Mm. I love that you say that because I immediately think of myself where the higher my awareness is around where I am mentally, the easier it is for me to one, predict what's going to happen next, but then also to have a clear understanding around what I need to do for myself to be in a better mental state. And I guess to your point, the fact that there isn't a single answer, maybe that is the answer, is, is mental health and mental well-being does look different for different people, potentially based on your resilience levels, the, your tenacity, some personality characteristics. But I think, I, I, and I often see this, and this is typical social media, uh, there's this huge difference between being tired and being burned out, um, disengaged, uh, um, unsure about my productivity levels, um, that just wanting to get out of bed. I, you know, I think all of this fits into this conversation. Yeah, 100%. And and knowing where you are on that curve, right, is so important. But like, you have to start to be able to know. So, you know, we are very passionate about getting the individual to be data driven around their own journey. Again, physical health, whether it's the kilometers you run, the weights you lift, you know where you stand, right? Yes. And so you need to find whatever resource it is that helps you benchmark your mental well being to know when it is, when are you dipping? Mm. When is it a dip mm. that actually is an alarm bell and is something that you need to escalate and get more serious care? When mm. is it a dip mm. that actually just says like you need to take a step back and you need a time out? Because as you say, you know, you want to take that step back when you're tired, not when it's too late and when you when you yeah. burnt out. Yeah. I think one of the things is people feel so time poor, right? And mental health is it's been quite like an area where people actually just don't know how to access the system. So you think like, mm. I'm struggling. Oh my goodness. I need to see a clinical psychologist. Like that's prohibitively expensive. And then you just don't do anything. But yes. the truth is, you know, unless you're already at the stage where there is something clinically to be worried about, there's just a, such a range of tools, interventions, different things for you to delve into. But the market has been, you know, it's been this kind of mystical thing. Like I don't really know where to enter. Um, and so mm. you need to work, do the work through demystifying it. I guess it's a lot of what we do as well to help someone navigate their journey, take that first step, um, yeah, and kind of yeah. explore where they are at. Yeah. And I'm glad you say that because I wanted, want the conversation now to go into a bit of what Panda health does. Um, so you have corporate clients, um, they take mental health seriously. They're prepared to do something about it prepared to provide this platform to the employees. Um, maybe just share an overview of, of the system, how you guys are doing this. And then I'd love to go into some insights and learning on the journey. What is being uncovered that we can share back to the audience to say, well, this is what the Panda Health team is seeing. If this is your organization, you're an HR exec listening to this, you know, um, don't necessarily wanting to pun Panda, but just give some yeah. insights around, around uh, the what is being done by you guys. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I think some of it, you know, was actually found as we were building. So we knew that we wanted to play in the proactive mental health care space. We knew that that's where there's really a gap for people. And as we started moving or working really, I guess, and moving into a B2B space, um, we realized that people actually, there was such a need for this that because they were interacting with the app so much, Firstly, the more they interacted with it, the deeper fingerprint we could, you know, form on an individual and say, you know, we live in a time of personalization, right? And again, not one size fits all. So, you know, when you sign on to the Panda app, your app should look very different to mine. Like what's mm. it recommending for you? You know, you love coaching courses because you love that like five minutes a day gets me somewhere and I'm going to be consistent. I love community because, you know, I'm feeling really lonely in the fact that I'm a working mom and like I'm the only one that's struggling and I want to connect with other people going through that. So, you know, the more you use it, the more personalized it gets. But what we also realized, I guess, almost by mistake was that because people were using it so much, we were surfacing very deep data insights for businesses. Sure. Now, this is a very important point, right? A massive part about 
panda is that you can remain completely confidential, right? It's very, mm. I guess, you know, important that you stay anonymous, that your, your, your personal identity is protected because there's such stigma attached with mental health. But when we look at a company as a whole, so Panda, the app is all about diagnosing the individual, whereas Panda Insights is about diagnosing the organization, right? To say, mm -hmm. organization, you've all accepted it's a good idea to invest in mental health, right? We actually are quite far up the curve that people are like, okay, this is a good idea, but they don't really know where to invest. And people do different things from thinking like this is a like high performance environment and managers are tough, like let's do a half day workshop and bullying. And the cost of that workshop, if it's not what people are really struggling with is severe, right? So through yeah. our, our insights, we're able to surface trends like, oh, people are struggling with productivity post COVID or communication or goal setting or mm -hmm. self image, mm -hmm. you know, those underlying things that actually drive the, the real stresses on this mm -hmm. organization base level and really help companies to design their interventions and then measure, you know, you can design interventions, you can throw money at something, but you want to know, like, is there an ROI of this? Has it moved the needle? And when you say, you know, what are companies seeing? So if we go back to those stats that I said at the beginning, you know, the lost productivity, the exit interviews, churn is a massive, massive thing, right? Yep. At the moment. Yep. And in a South African context, we're in a real talent war, right? You want to put as much around your employees to help them succeed, help them be happy really in your environment. So those are indicators that we really work closely with businesses, like understand your absenteeism, your potential presenteeism levels, the churn, yeah. and build it into KPIs for, for managers, because that's the important thing, right? Wellness or the, the HR director can't be responsible for the whole organization's happiness, right? There's a saying, right? People don't leave yes. organizations, they leave managers. Yes, and so yes. again, like how do you actually at a big enough team level, like identify where the happiest teams in our business, where are the unhappiest? Is it a workload? Is it a leadership? And how do we actually use these data points to drive important things like culture in the business? So sure. yeah, I hope that answered your question. No, you, you did. I think there's so much here and a couple of days ago, the previous episode I did was with Celo Governor, and we spoke about data and using data to create insights, to make meaningful decisions that have an impact on the individual and the organization. And I guess, irrespective of the context, that is such a big part of any organization's success. Can I predict what my people are going to do, feel, look, be, perform? Because that has got a direct effect on me, the environment, the culture, and the performance of the organization. You know, I always say culture is nothing else than leadership behavior. And I guess in this context, the organization's well-being, which in turn has got a direct effect on the performance of the business, will start from, are your people well? Yeah. And what I love about what you're saying is two things. One, it is a personalized journey, so the intervention needs to be personalized. Secondly, I need to be psychologically safe to be able to share where I'm at because that might in turn be used against me for bullying as an example. So yes, keep it confidential, but then create that space where if I am sharing with you, you're going to do something about it. That's not shifting responsibility of my mental health back to you, but creating a platform for you to give me job resources to help me with my job demands. 100%. So Mandy, what I what I also love what you what you're saying is one, the the journey needs to be personal because my mental health is is where I'm at. And it's not going to be the same. There might be similar trends and themes, but whatever intervention is given to me as an employee needs to meet me where I'm at. That's one thing. But for that to happen, I need a psychologically safe environment yeah. so that I can share vulnerably, authentically what's going on in my heart, my head, or wherever this is sitting, so that you are able to then do something about it. And that's where I love the personal journey, but then also the organizational insights. Because on the insight level, on the organization level, that's really where it's hitting hard on the bottom line. You mentioned productivity, absenteeism, turnover. Like these are all elements that no one gets an invoice for at the end of the month. But over a period, you look back and you go, well, why didn't we launch that part of the app while the entire dev team was sick the whole time, as an example? Yeah. Um, or why didn't we make our sales? Well, half of the sales team were so tired they didn't get to their KPAs. So it, it, it's so beautiful how this conversation does link together 
where you need metrics, a safe environment, and then an intervention that can match that individual, but also organizational level data that will ultimately inform you and tell you exactly what your culture is like. Yeah, that's exactly because it's rare, right? Like, you know, in an assessment world, and this is kind of the world, I guess, you you know, well, from an organizational psychology perspective, certain assessments and the Enneagrams and all of those things that help an end of, you know, teams and individuals understand each other. Are, I love them. They're like one of my favorite things. But when it comes to mental health and specific and how people perceive it, like they want to be sure that you can't surface anything individually mm -hmm. about them, right? And mm -hmm. so typically as an organization, like how do you deliver individual care when the individual doesn't want to give you any individual data, right? Sure, and so I think sure. that's what we've been able to use technology to do, right? Because we can target the individual directly to say the more you interact, the more we understand you and here's your path and it has absolutely nothing to do with your employer, right? But yeah. as a collective, as an organization, people are often struggling from similar things, you know, either linked to the organization or sometimes their personal lives, but largely linked to the organization, right? We, we actually spend the majority of our lives at work. 100%. And so 100%. from that perspective, you know, the organization wants to understand, like, what is going on here? Why are we losing people? You know, often our traditional EAPs, you know, or, or programs we have in place are only being accessed 5% on average a year. So like any report I get from them is only telling me something about 5% of people. Like how do I diagnose the majority and, and how do I mm. use data mm. to make decisions? So yeah, I think that's been a unique balance to strike where you can, you can actually address both parties needs. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And there's one thing that you said that I just want to bring us back to, and that's one person like the HR director can't be responsible for the entire organization's well-being. So there is a responsibility back on management. Yeah. And have you seen that being taken up as a positive or is it perceived as a burden? Like I'm going the manager, you know what, Mandy's not my problem. Like she must sort yeah. herself out. She's here to do a job. Yeah. You know, that, that I can imagine could be someone's answer to this entire conversation. Listen, you get you get that, right? And I'm from an industry, luckily not an organization, I'll say that because I don't want it to be misconceived. I think, you know, where I came from was actually a super caring organization, or like a, you know, competitive and move fast organization, but a caring one. Whereas like often, you know, in, in these kind of professional services, professions, the pressure's high, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, billable hours scenario, people are, and, and, and an older generation can also be like, well, suck it up like we did it yes right? yes so cowboys get, don't cry yeah you do get elements of that but i think so many people have realized over the past few years that mental health is not this thing that only a few people struggle with and i think it's mm. more being like managers are just overwhelmed they actually want to help but they have their own kpi sitting over their head then they have a team of 10 people of which you know at least half of them are struggling from different things <laughs> going on in their lives and you know they actually sometimes you actually just don't know how to support you know the people mm -hmm. in your team mm -hmm. so a big thing though is from lead for uh, like for leaders to lead from the front though i think that's been something that we've also seen as being mm -hmm. so successful because yes. when the tone is set at the top you know people it, it does you know it's on a lot of companies agendas let's destigmatize mental health great it's a great mission statement right yes. but how are you actually going to do that yeah. well, what now yeah exactly and so you know what we've just been able to do through the app is we we host what we call closed groups so it'll be just for your company a leader in the business comes in and hosts a session alongside one of our mental health professionals on a topic again that's been surfaced at organizational level to be an issue and it's incredible to see the shoot up in utilization after something like that, because again, a leader has led from the front. They've shared the message that it's not only okay, like come into this space, use these mm, tools. Mm, mm. Um, and that's so important because we all look up to our leaders and think you per the same way. I guess we looked up to our parents when you're younger, right? You think they perfect they're and they've got everything yes. sorted out. And now that we adults, you realize it's just, <laughs> no one has it <laughs> sorted out. Right. And it's no, the same. No. I, I completely agree with you because at the end of the day, if if that vulnerability is modeled at a level where there's this perceived power distance, then it opens up the door for the everyday person to go, oh, I can speak about this. And then the more that happens, the more it becomes like at Whamley, we've got this value called radical honesty, 
where we encourage people, irrespective of your role, to just be honest. Yeah. And, and we call people on that behavior. And so that's a small example of this. But the other thing that you said that, that is really interesting and I think is such a good place for technology like yours is it is not expected of every manager to be a psychologist. That's just too much pressure. You could actually do way more harm than good. Yeah. So, so to be that placeholder that acknowledges that Mandy is going through what she's going through and then have a resource that the organization has bought into with the proper care guidance experts programs material content on there that is you know well researched and 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 that can really speak to the problem as the actual facilitator of the conversation i think to have that balance is is so good because i i've met people in the past where they feel this burden to especially if you're a high caring high empathy person you like now it's my problem to sort out so i i, I take your rocks and i put it in my backpack and, and, and that's not good for the manager either. Yeah. No, it's definitely not. And to that point, I think there's, there's also such a need at the leadership level for support. You know, support mm. for putting all those rocks in their bag because most people do, right? Yes. You know, most people, they've r r like risen into leadership positions, sometimes just because they're good at their role, but often just because they are a, a people person, right? They care about their people. And so how do you also put the support around them, right? As they are sure. carrying that load. But sure. yeah, very so important good. for them to have a resource that they can actually, you know, whether it's panned or something completely different, it doesn't matter, but something that people are willing to engage with, something that people mm. do trust, something that people see like, oh, behind this is real scientific evidence, you know, it's not yeah. just a fun thing to do. So as we land the plane, I'm going to ask you a hard question. Do you <laughs> think mental health is going to get worse? Or do you think we've just raised the bar in terms of what we need to deal with, with everything that's going on, the political landscape, the economic landscape, all the technology that we've been, that we get thrown with? Is it just the new norm and we need to deal with it? Or do you think, or maybe your research showing that you know we, we could actually stabilize from this and, and get back to a better yeah. state of mental health it's a very good question and because i'm a chartered accountant so i'm going to default rather to the <laughs> to the experts but i mean jokes aside i think the the world health organization predicts that mental health is going to be the leading cause of disability by 2030. so it is sure. going to get much much worse and if you actually dig into the numbers currently mental health is costing the south african economy more than load shedding is so that is a scary wow. metric wow. to actually dig into, right? Sure. Low yeah, shedding, something that's... we can see and feel every single day, right? Um, but there's already, there's a suicide every hour in the country, you know, and the, and the pressure is just immense. And, and it's not changing, right? The, the always on culture of life. It's, it's definitely not going to get mm -hmm. easier. I mean, I have kids and I worry about, you know, the world that they grow up in because of all the pressures surrounding you. So, I don't think it's going to get better or easier. I think it's going to become more and more important to build that mental resilience. And it's hard because, again, physical health perspective, you start working out, you look great. Everyone's like, oh, my gosh, look at what you've done. Mental health is a complete thing you have to do for yourself. You know, you're not going to get any external validation. You need to realize, like, why this is important and, and be consistent yeah. around it. Yeah, it's crazy you say that because when it's going well with you, you're assumed to be normal. Yeah. When it's not going well with you, the stigma is there's something wrong, so go and sort it out. And and that mindset, the collective mindset needs to change. I completely agree with you. Mandy, maybe a last question on the topic. What are some of the, the obvious trends that you are picking up with your clients? Please don't share a name, please don't share a logo, but just a theme so that if the audience member is listening to this, they can resonate. Um, and, and we can create that awareness that you're not alone. This is yeah. what, what the stats are saying, like on a, like a micro level in the South African economy from a, from a business perspective. Yeah. Very good question. I think main trends, burnout shouldn't be surprising. Um, but underlying causes of it is again, what's important. So the burnout, the mm. outcome, right? Financial stress, massive indicator, right? We're living in a very tough macroeconomic environment. And you have the dynamic where often people are the first in their family to have a job. 
right? Sure. So it's easy to walk into like one of these fancy organizations and I was guilty of it and think like, this is great. All my peers have risen to the same level and I live in this equal society in South Africa and you haven't considered like what it took them to get there in the morning still, who they taking care of. So financial stress wow. is, is really big. Work stress is a big trend. So again, that's something that you really can directly intervene in mm. as a company. And the third one is communication. And I'm, um, you know, pretty confident wow. on the fact that, by it's, that it's because of this remote world that we found ourselves in, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, we think we're communicating, but we it's a very different, it's quite transactional. Um, and what is communication? Like the ripple effects have been that people don't know how to goal set appropriately. They then I'm suffer from things like self image because, you know, you just get in this negative feedback loop because you haven't set the original goals properly because you haven't actually communicated properly up front. Right. Sure. So yeah, those are the really interesting and I think different trends that we pick up that people are like, oh, that actually makes perfect sense, but we never would have thought about it. Wow. That's fascinating. Well, I want to thank you for your time. This was really insightful. I, I believe we need to speak about this more. And um, I'm really hopeful that, that through your organization and through the work that you guys and, and many similar organizations are doing across the world that we can, we can lift uh, this topic away from the stigma that it is dark and we shouldn't be speaking about it and deal, deal with it by yourself to a point where, you know what, we're actually all in this together. And if we're just honest for a second and authentic around it, we can remove the ambiguity and the awkwardness and get to a place where we can speak about it and then have these uh, type of resources in place to assist and help people. So good luck on your journey and thank you so much for joining the episode. Thank you so much for having me and putting mental health on the map through solving the people puzzle.